Council, the mayor going against the objections of two of the council's prominent caucuses, making up 36 votes in the 51 member council. Dozens of council members have said they oppose Mastro uh, due to his work with conservative clients and because of his time working as deputy mayor under former Republican mayor Rudy, Rudy Giuliani. This uh, all comes as uh, the former corporation council, Sylvia Hines Radix, resigned earlier this summer, creating the vacancy for Mastro's appointment. Bob Hart is, is with me. Bob, the, the mayor has so many legal problems. Uh, and there's concern here that that's why that Randy he needs Mastro that ended up being a personal lawyer rather than a city lawyer. Exactly. Yeah, and that point you just made hasn't really been raised by the city council as much, Pat. But I think that's the most valid uh, yellow flag to be raised, to saying, "Listen, exactly, you've been subpoenaed. Uh, there's probes going on." And Randy Mastro is a, a terrific defense attorney. He's, he's a great attorney in general. But will his job? How much of his job will be about you, Mayor Adams, as opposed to the rest of the city? I think that's the most relevant question, not who he worked for, not what he did under the Giuliani administration, uh, where he was very effective. So I think that's the big question. Yeah, I, I feel like every lawyer in, in any role has taken on a client they disagreed with or, or an unsavory client. Uh, Mastro, I believe, has the ability to step beyond that if he's in this role for a Democratic mayor. And, and he's also the chair of a good government group. Uh, he, he's, uh, I would say... Uh, I, I don't know if he's a registered Democrat or Republican, but I would say he's pretty moderate in, in his views overall, and he, he was in the administration. Listen, the relations are so frosty between the council and the mayor right now <laughs> that you could be appointing Clarence Darrow and there'd be a pushback from the council. So some of this goes way beyond who Randy Mastro is. Yeah. Uh, this is a bit of an inside media story, but I think it's worth mentioning, Bob. The, we and, and others who are reporting on the NYPD have been able to, for decades, listen to their radio transmissions. The NYPD has been shifting to encrypted communications channels, and, and they're making the first of those moves. What does this mean to the public? Well, what it means is that something serious could be going on in their backyard, and unless the police department is telling them about it, they won't know about it. And uh, in the past, we in the media would find out about it and start making asking questions, would go to a crime scene before being told about it. So the, the, the mayor's team likes to say uh, this uh, yeah. uh, keeps others from monitoring. They want to hide the, those the DV police. cases. I would love to hear an example because uh, please tell us like, hey, you know, such and such a bank robber found out that, that we were mm -hmm. coming because you were monitoring the frequency. I don't think those stories exist, or if they do, we haven't heard them as, as one of the excuses about the encryption. Black women knew that uh, they were coming to presidential politics because they could Donald hear Trump them. yesterday was again saying, uh, I, I don't like the ability of ABC to be unbiased as the debate host on September 10th. And there was some back and forth between the Harris and Trump campaigns over whether the rules that Biden had agreed to several months ago should be the rules for the September 10th debate. If you recall in that debate, the rule was supposed to be that uh, when one candidate was speaking, the other candidate's mic was turned off, even if that other candidate was trying to, to interrupt the person who was speaking. There were a, a, a few moments in the debate in June where they did have both microphones on, like this one. I told you before, I'm happy to play golf if you carry your own bag. Think you can do it? Yeah, so look how that turned out. Six handicap of all. I was an eight handicap. Yeah. So, so Bob, you heard there that they, they you know, they said them that the Trump mic was going to be off, but then he's on camera talking. What do you do? But, but turn the mic on. <laughs> how do you think this is going to end up in these negotiations? I, I mean, debates over debates. Like a black know, woman talking to her son or her husband in her home. As someone who's overseen the production of, of do literally dozens of debates, I always want the mics on. This was a special request by the Biden team. I think it makes it much for, more spontaneous. I mean, imagine, Pat, if it was your turn and it's my turn, and then you can't hear me, my mic is off. You know, it's just, yeah. it, it's not good TV. It's not good for debate. So hopefully the mics are on and this debate goes on as planned. I, I think the only way the candidates can fact check each other uh, is if the microphones are turned on. I mean, that, Kamala Harris yelling <laughs> across the room with Donald Trump or the other way around doesn't work well on TV if the mics are turned down, but we'll see whether they uh, agree to amend the rules. Uh, I want to talk about something we'll about see. the Trump campaign yesterday. <laughs> the National Cemetery. Uh, it, it, the, uh, the appearance has raised some, some controversy. Was it a campaign appearance 
on sacred ground. Yeah, Pat, you know, the, the former president raised the Afghanistan uh, evacuation, the disastrous Afghanistan evacuation uh, at Arlington. And I think, listen, it's a legitimate campaign point, but you should be very, very careful uh, when you're at a cemetery uh, where there's dead soldiers buried to raise any kind of political points. And I, I think it's a fair, a fair push uh, by Democrats and others to say, hey, this isn't the time or the place. Mm -hmm. I think there's plenty of places and times to talk about Afghanistan. You've got rappers digging up graves okay, at cemeteries. Here, there was a new polo yesterday. I think it's still too early what to you really understand. About? what the exit of RFK from the race is going to mean. But this Echelon Insight survey puts Trump now narrowly ahead 49 to 48. The, does the absence of a, a prominent third party candidate make a difference here, Bob? We really have to look state by state. And we know it. We may not even know until exit polls, Pat, in some of, the, in some of these swing states. Kennedy uh, wasn't on the ballot in all the swing states. Uh, he was about, uh, on, I think, about 20 states. His name was on the ballot. It's going to be on the ballot in some states. So I don't think we're really going to know. I thought that he appealed more to Trump voters. So there's probably some truth there. But we're really going to have to wait and see and maybe not know till December. Thank you, as always, Bob. Thanks, Pat. And at 8.38, we'll update the morning commission.